Lord Jesus, we thank you this morning that we are surrounded by your favor with a shield. We thank you that you have not just given to us eternal life and then left us alone, but that you are with us each and every day, that you are guarding and protecting us. So, Father God, as we come before you this morning, Lord, I pray that you will remind each and every one of us of your great favor and the love that you have for us. As we look into your holy word, may it come alive to our hearts and may it be put into practice in our lives. Lord God, we ask this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. We are reading from Psalm chapter 5, verses 11 to 12. But let all who take refuge in you be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. Spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may rejoice in you. Surely, Lord, you bless the righteous. You surround them with your favor, as with a shield. Amen. Our scripture is taken from Mark chapter 9, verses 14 to 27. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about? he asked. A man in the crowd answered, Teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, How long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, 
Everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the impure spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, He's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. This is the word of the Lord. We're going to continue on our uh, series on putting on the whole armor of God. Uh, today we're looking at the idea of faith like a shield faith like a shield now some years ago when I I looked at this passage to to preach it for the first time I never imagined I would have to explain what the idea of faith actually is but we live in a society which has dramatically changed we live in a society which has redefined faith uh, to be this this nonsensical uh, definition, an, an illogical definition. Faith has been redefined in the hearts and the minds of many people as blind faith. Now think about that for a second. They are saying that faith equals blind faith. And you wouldn't have to say blind faith if faith was automatically blind, but this has how the definition is is coming about uh, in, in the minds of many people today. They think of, of faith as being a blind leap of faith into darkness, a stepping off of the ledge into the unknown. But the, the biblical understanding of the word faith is, is somewhat different than that. The, the biblical understanding of faith is that it is trust. It is trusting someone who has been faithful to you to continue to be faithful. Trusting someone who has uh, demonstrated uh, integrity to continue to demonstrate uh, integrity. As, as one person has said, the best indicator of future behavior is past behavior. So for the Christian, faith in God means we have looked at the evidence of God's behavior, seen how God has acted in the past, and we are trusting him to continue to act in the same manner. That's what we mean by faith. And that's the definition we're going to go with for the word faith. A trust in God who has been faithful to people in the past and will continue to be faithful to people in the present and in the future. So as we, we continue this look at uh, putting on the whole armor of God, we go back to, to Ephesians chapter 6. We see there the Apostle Paul talking about putting on uh, the armor of God, and he says, having faith like a shield. The second question, the first question would be, how do we define faith? The second question is, what kind of shield are we talking about? Now, some people might have in mind the idea of one of those little round shields that you see in, in movies. You know, uh, two people with great swords, they've got little round shields, they attack each other, they, they hold their shield up with one arm and they swing the sword with the other arm. And uh, they're very solid, they're very uh, rigid, made out of wood or they're made out of metal. And they're not particularly useful for an army, and they're not particularly useful uh, for quenching the darts of the enemy, as we'll get to. Um, it, you can just imagine if uh, an arrow is shot at this the shield, it's either going to reflect off and uh, go somewhere, maybe possibly do damage somewhere else, or it's going to, to stick into that little round shield and limit the ability of the person carrying the shield to uh, continue in the fight. So the idea is it'll weigh them down or it will uh, cause collateral damage. The Apostle Paul is not talking about this kind of shield. 
What he has in mind is a little bit different. What he's got in mind is that Roman style of, of, of shield that the legions used, uh, which basically looked like a large door. Let me give to you a description of this shield. And this the shield uh, talked about by the Apostle Paul is called a thurios. And I'm sure my, my Latin and my Greek are absolutely terrible. But the thurios was a, a shield. It was like a large door-shaped contraption standing about four feet high and about two and a half feet wide. Now, when you consider the average man in Europe, what might have been five and a half feet tall? You think about the average man in the in the Roman legion might have been about five and a half feet tall. A thurio shield at four feet tall is pretty much going to cover the whole individual. A two and a half feet wide, four feet tall. It's going to, to, to cover the whole person. It's not designed for hand-to-hand -hand combat. This is a really critical idea. The early church was not designed for individuals to go off on their own and have those uh, battles of heroes. Like we think of, uh, of David, the shepherd boy, going up against Goliath. And that kind of battle is not what we're looking at in the church. In fact, when, when you look at, at, at David, the story is he's getting ready, and Saul comes to him and says, put on my armor. David gets dressed in Saul's armor and his sword and his shield and all of that stuff. And he says, man, I can't use this. I cannot fight the fight that God has called me to fight in this armor. He takes it all off and he goes equipped with his sling. All right. David understood the, bat the type of battle he was going in, that one-on-one -on -one battle, required him to be dressed differently than if he was going in as part of an army. The church is not called to be another group of, of Davids. We're not called to be, uh, you know, picking up our sling and our stones. We're called to actually be in the army of God. We're called to work together. And if we're working together, we need Thurios type faith. We need that kind of faith that's built like a barn door. Uh, and, and, and in the effect of carrying these shields together for the Roman army is having these sh shields is, first of all, they interlocked. A group of soldiers could get together and interlock their shields. Uh, the ones in the front would hold their shields in the front to the sides. They would hold their shields to the side. Uh, those in the middle would hold their shields above. So on all sides, even in the back, they are covered with shields and they move forward together. You can think of it as the world's earliest sort of, of mobile tank. Yes, it was foot powered, you know, kind of a Flintstones, kind of a, a thinking, all those feet underneath moving together. This was their tank. But everybody inside, as long as they hung together, as long as they stuck together, was protected by that interlocking group of shields. This is how the church is called to, to act with their faith, to have our faith interlocking. Ah, but you might ask the question, what about those, those flaming darts that get shot at the soldiers? Sure, if you've got interlocking shields, you're not moving anywhere quickly. You don't have to worry about a, uh, an arrow that's shot and gets stuck in a shield and, and weighing it down. These are heavy things to begin with. Uh, nobody's going out and, and, and you know, uh, doing the great heroic uh, individual fighting, carrying these shields. They're working together. But what about those flaming darts? What if they hit the shield and bounce off and, and go into amidst the men? All of a sudden, the men are going to be dropping their shields to put out the flames, you know, especially if they get the flames from these flaming darts into their clothing and their clothing catches on fire. It's because and that doesn't happen. And the reason it doesn't happen or it didn't happen that way, it was because these, these Roman shields, which were made of wood, 
were covered in leather. And that leather before the battle was soaked in water. So these are a heavy thing. These shields are soaked in water. They're waterlogged. They're sopping wet. Uh, an arrow that's on fire strikes it is going to stick. A flaming dart that hits it is just going to burn and flutter out uh, harmlessly. And, and this is one of the, the secrets of the Roman army was they fought as units. They fought as groups. They, they were together. They didn't go off and break off into uh, individual heroes trying to fight the enemy. They stuck together. And in fact, when you, you read the accounts of, of, of Rome just conquering uh, nation after nation after nation, their army was incredibly effective. Uh, they didn't have to have years and years and years of training, but they worked together. They went into battle together. They had basic training together, and then they went into battle. And as long as they stuck together, they tended to be victorious. As long as they didn't engage one-on-one uh, -on -one combat, you know, with the, the heroes, you know, that, that kind of of thinking that lone ranger mentality as long as they didn't do that as long as they were together they were protected and they would almost inevitably be triumphant what we take from this first of all what we take from this as a church is the shield of faith a shield like a thurios is not the shield of a hero it's not the shield of a, a legendary believer who strides through the land victorious and triumphant with his little round shield, his great broadsword, fighting all of the enemies single-handedly. You know, it makes a great action movie, but it doesn't make for great Christian faith. It doesn't make for a great Christian practice. How many, how many people have we known who have gone off to be that, that great action hero of the faith? off by themselves, doing the work alone, with no support, no backup, no team, and then failure. You know, you, you can think of the ministry of, of Billy Graham. Now, what is it that, that made Billy Graham quite a success? Well, first of all, he stuck to a good message. He preached the gospel. He followed the Lord, but he always had a team. You know, if, if, if the Billy Graham rally came to your area, there was a team, an advanced team that came in. There was all kinds of people who were involved, who were brought in to be a, a part of that ministry. And that's why it was always so successful. Because it wasn't about Billy Graham. It was about a group of Christians working together, coordinated together, to present, to present the gospel of Jesus Christ to the lost. And in our Christian lives, we're not called to be the greatest American hero. We're not called to, to go in and do that, that battling all on our own. We're called to work together. This is what it means to have a faith like a shield. We have a faith that covers us we have a faith that covers each other. We're working together. We're striving together. But how does that work in practical terms? Doesn't each one of us, therefore, have to have a fantastic, great faith? Doesn't each one of us have to be striding the land like giants in order to the church work effectively? That's an interesting question. But let's turn to our, our scripture passage this morning, that, that passage on the father who has uh, been struggling for years with a son who is demon-possessed. Now, I want to stop for a second right there and do it a little aside. When it talks about the son in this scripture being demon-possessed, that's not saying that everybody who has uh, a medical condition is demon-possessed. You can't take that out of this passage. You cannot assume from this passage it's saying that everybody who's sick, everybody who has epilepsy, everybody who has a medical condition is demon-possessed. 
that's way off the mark and that's not what the scripture is talking about it's talking about an individual person an individual boy a young man who has been demon possessed since he was a child now the the characteristics of the demon possession here was the boy didn't talk he was mute all right now i'm not saying all people who are mute were demon possessed but i'm saying this is a symptom of this particular person's demon possession and he also had a habit of having seizures whenever he got close to to fires or or when he got close to water the demon was constantly throwing him down causing him to fall down in the hopes that he would die and so this man he's desperate for his son he brings his son to Jesus but Jesus is off uh, with a few of his disciples and so the remaining disciples are there they're doing miracles and they come to this boy and they can't cast the demon out and so the father is getting quite desperate and then Jesus and a couple of his disciples they arrive from where they've been and everybody rushes up to Jesus and Jesus says what's going on and they say well we've been trying to cast out this demon we can't get the demon out of him and of course Jesus kind of rebukes them a little bit and the father is pleading the father of this boy is pleading with Jesus to rescue his son to save his son and at one point Jesus says to this man everything is possible for him who believes everything is possible for him who believes to this the man replies I do believe help my unbelief I do believe help me overcome my unbelief he believes that Jesus is the miracle worker but he's not sure if if he's good enough that Jesus would bother to do a miracle for him. His faith is falling short. And this simple story shows us how we get faith like a Thurios. How we get faith like that Roman shield, that four foot high, two and a half foot wide Roman shield. The faith that shields us from the flaming darts of the enemy is a gift from God. The boy's father was, was tied up by his unbelief and asked Jesus to help him to believe. Like him, we are to ask God for help. If we come across a place in our life where we have unbelief, we are to cry out to God, Lord, I believe, help me overcome my unbelief. God gives us the faith that we need in order to believe in him. This is the key. The faith to believe in God and in his power comes from God. The faith to believe in God and to believe in his power comes from God. The man's situation in this passage is an example of the situation that the situations that we all have faced at one time or another. That our faith is inadequate without God's help. For the believer, we have all had times when we want to have faith in God, where we want to have enough faith to accomplish great things for God, but our faith has come up short. We therefore need to go to God to ask Him to give us the level of faith we need so that we can stand with our brothers and sisters in the difficult times and be shielded by the f from the fiery darts of the enemy. We need to go to God to ask for that faith. God is the source of our faith. How do we, how, how do we trust God? We look at what he's done. We know the actions of God from the past, how he has behaved in times past we listen to the testimonies where do we hear testimonies first and foremost you want a good testimony about the faithfulness of God go to the scriptures but down through history there have been testimonies given of, of people outside of scripture who say God is 
faithful. Look what he has done for me. One of my great heroes in the faith is, is a man who lived in the 19th century. His name was George Mueller. And some of you know who George Mueller was. He ran orphanages in Bristol, England for many decades. And in all of that time, the many thousands of orphans that he, he cared for, he raised, he educated, he fed, he clothed them in his, his orphanage. He never once went to the government and asked for money. He never once uh, put on a, a fundraising drive. He never once threatened that if people didn't give him money, God was going to take him home. He went to God and he prayed. There were days they sat down at the dinner table and thanked God for food, and there was not a speck of food in the orphanage. And by the time they got to the amen, the amen in that prayer, there'd been a knock at the door, and their supper had been provided, and they didn't know by who. And nobody knew that they didn't have food that day, but God always provided We're called to have faith like a Thurios, a faith that is given to us by God, a faith that we can hold on to firm. See, the, the apostles understood faith. They understood faith as knowing. Faith is not blindly trusting. Faith is knowing. We are called to have a faith that is based on knowing God. We're called to have a, a faith that is called uh, to, to believe God, to obey the truth as God has revealed it to us, as we have experienced even in our own lives. There's no room in Christianity for blind faith. This blind faith stuff has got nothing to do with Jesus. It's got nothing to do with God the Father. It has nothing to do with how the Christian lives their life. We're supposed to carry our faith. It's, it's solid. It's real. It's grounded in Christ Jesus. It's grounded in God the Father. A blind faith in God that does not interact with our daily lives has no place in our lives. A blind faith in which we, we hope God might do something is useless to us. We need to have faith in our equipment, and we need to have trust in the God in whom we serve, and he's given to us faith. It's big, it's clunky, it's heavy, it's effective and powerful as we stand together. It's like carrying the barn door into battle. But think about this for a second. If you're a soldier, and you don't trust your equipment. You're afraid your, your, your shoes are going to fall off your feet the moment the battle starts. If you're scared, the, the breastplate on, on your chest is going to fall off the moment things get tough. If you think that the shield you're holding up is really only made of styrofoam and not a solid structure, what are you going to do when the battle starts? You're going to run away. If you don't know your own equipment, this, the soldier will run away. We're called to know our equipment. We're called to stand firm, trusting in our Lord and Savior. Trusting that the gospel on our feet is there securely. Trusting that the righteousness of God is, is, is there securely. Trusting that the truth is there securely. Trusting in the one who has equipped us. But the enemy wants us to doubt. The enemy wants us to doubt our equipment. This is why it says in Scripture that Satan goes about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he can devour. Whom can he devour? It's the soldier running away from battle. If your back is to the enemy and your feet are going as fast as they can to get away, they can come upon you like a lion and take you down. Satan is interested in the easy kill. He's interested in picking off those who have lost their nerve. Or those who have never had faith in God. Those who have never had faith like a shield to protect themselves. Those who have never even trusted the church. 
Faith in God protects us as individuals and as the body of Christ from the exposure to defeat. It protects us from becoming an easy target for Satan. Now, I'm not saying we won't go through hard times. I'm not saying that having faith like a shield means we're not going to experience the difficulties of, of the battles of this life. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying that when we have the faith like a Thurio shield, we are protected in those battles, protected at the most important level in our relationship with God, and at the second most important level in our relationship with each other in the church. As we come to know God, we will understand that God is faithful. How often? How often is God faithful? Sometimes. A little bit here and there. Once in a while when he feels like it. You know, I heard, I heard one of the great theologians of another religion say that even if they've got one foot in heaven, they're afraid that God might be having a bad day and say, nope, you can't come in. That's not the God we serve. The God we serve is faithful. The God we serve is not capricious. The God we serve is just and merciful. The God we serve is trustworthy. We can have faith. We can have trust in the one who is trustworthy. We can carry that Thurio shield. Why? Because we're trustworthy? No. Because the God we serve is trustworthy. We can hold that faith firmly, that faith that God has given to us, that trust we can have in God. We can interconnect our shields with our fellow believers as we trust in God together. Do you trust God? Do you trust God? Can you honestly say in your life, I've got faith like a like a barn door. I got faith like a, a Thurio shield. It's there in front of me because I trust the one who gave it to me. I trust in God. I trust the one who died on the cross for my sins. I trust the one who rose from the dead, triumphant over sin and death. I trust the one who holds my soul in the palm of his hand. I trust the one who has promised to return and is one day going to take me to be with him. Can you say that? Can you look at Jesus and say, I trust you? Many of us know of people who once walked away from their faith in God. At some point, they decided that Jesus was not trustworthy. At some point in their life, they looked at God and said, I don't trust you in this battle anymore. This shield of, of faith you've given to me, it's too heavy. It, it, it requires too much. I'm getting rid of it. Many of us have known people like that hurt and disillusioned in life, perhaps by some flaw they see in a fellow believer, perhaps by some flaw they see in their pastor, perhaps some flaw they see in the church, they walk away. They take their faith and they throw it down or they, they slowly allow it to, to rot away in their arms. They let it, the water that's there to quench the flames dry off. They don't refresh the shields. The shields become a cumbersome burden. They cast them down and off they go. Prisoners of the enemy. They go off into bondage to the enemy. Jesus whom they once trusted. Jesus whom they, they once held dear. They've turned their backs on. They have surrendered to doubt. Alone and without the support of friends and family, they have become prisoners of war. It's such a sad story in the Christian life. When we see people taking their shields and putting them away. When we see people surrendering to the enemy. Allowing the enemy to pierce them through with flaming darts into their souls. Our challenge 
is not to be discouraged by this. Our challenge is not to look at those who have, have given up the battle. Our challenge is to continue to trust. He who is faithful will finish the work. He who is faithful will finish the work. And we're not talking about ourselves. We're talking about Christ Jesus. We are trusting in the one who has promised to never leave us, never forsake us. We are trusting in the one who will take care of us through all eternity. We are trusting in the one who has promised us eternal life. I encourage you as, as a believer in Jesus to hold firm to that shield of faith. Keep it strapped on your arm. Yes, it might be as big as a barn door, but it has an, an effective work to do. As we trust in Jesus, as we trust in God the Father, it will protect us from the flaming darts of the enemy. It's not a blind trust. It's not a blind faith. It's a faith based upon reality. We look at what God has done. We look at what God is continuing to do. And even in the times of the darkest night, we should never forget the light of Christ Jesus. Even in the heated times of battle, we should not forget the Lord we serve. So I encourage you today, if your faith has gotten a little dry, if that shield of faith upon your arm has gotten a little heavy, if you've forgotten why we can trust so fully in Christ Jesus, I pray that you will turn to him. I pray that you will strengthen yourself as you go to Christ and ask forgiveness. Ask for him to renew your faith. And if you've never had faith in Christ Jesus, I challenge you. I challenge you to, to come and to try believing trusting in your creator the one who died for you the one who rose from the dead the one who lives forevermore and the one who is promising to you eternal life this life is a battle we struggle in this life so I, I encourage you trust in Jesus have faith like a thurio shield shall we pray Lord Jesus, we thank you this day. We thank you that you have not left us, you've not abandoned us, and that in you, as we trust in you, we can have victory over the trials of this life. Lord Jesus, I pray you'll be with each and every person here watching this video. I ask this in your holy and precious name. Amen.
Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and fall from your secure position, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen.